Welcome to Who's in STEM. I'm Ken Ono, your host and the STEM advisor to the provost and the Marvin Rosenblum Professor of Mathematics at UVA. Our goal is to evoke flights of imagination and wonder by showcasing the cornucopia of all that is STEM at UVA, the marvelous world of UVA science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. AI is short for artificial intelligence, and it's in the air. Everyone's talking about it, everywhere and all the time. ChatGPT, large language models, and so on. But today, instead, let's talk about NI, natural intelligence. Brains and nervous systems are amazing, right? Just picture a healthy infant. Picture toddlers. They learn stuff at an extraordinary rate. They learn to walk, speak, and read at what seems like no time. I also like that toddlers are budding scientists. They know about the process of experimentation. When they're playing, they're experimenting. They're testing hypotheses. It's the method of science. As an example, picture toddlers playing with towers of Winnie the Pooh blocks. They giggle when they knock the towers over. The hypothesis that they're testing, that towers of blocks fall over when pushed by sticky, chubby hands. And then they repeat and repeat again, all in good fun. Toddlers are our first scientists, and they're learning about gravity. Now, why do I start this way? Because I want to remind everyone that we know that human brains are among the most remarkable computers we know. In fact, they are the model of the computer. Our brains are so awesome that we chuckle when they malfunction or are a bit glitchy. I'm talking about brain farts. Who hasn't gone to the grocery store to get four things but then forgot what in the world the fourth thing was? We love Dory, the adorable blue tang from Finding Nemo. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Just because keep she had no short-term memory. As in the film, while she happens to save the day because she finds her memory. Right? P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way. Now the most famous address in Sydney, Australia. Unfortunately, life isn't the stuff of Disney Pixar movies. Our brains aren't like our laptops or cell phones that magically work when restarted, don't we wish? In real life, it's devastating, and we've all experienced this. It's devastating to see friends and family struggle with cognitive decline and deficit. Think Alzheimer's, dementia, brain injuries, and epilepsy. Our minds are fragile. But at UVA... We're doing something about it. We have leading scientists studying brains, studying neuroscience with a simple goal. The goal being to defeat these significant health challenges. What are we doing about it? Well, last year, last June, UVA invested $75 million in a grand challenge called Brain and Neuroscience. The goal, to pioneer life-changing advances in neuroscience while simultaneously mapping the workings of the human brain. One of the most exciting things happening at UVA. It impacts us all. And so that's what we want to talk about today. And it's a a pleasure to welcome Jaideep Kapoor and Sarah Kusinis. Dr. Kapoor is the UVA Eugene Meyer Professor of Neuroscience, and he's the director of the Brain Institute. He is an internationally acclaimed expert in epilepsy. Sarah Kusinis is a professor of biology and the co-director of the Brain Institute, Dr. Cassinis is a world expert in neural development. She loves zebrafish. She loves swimming, too. In fact, she was a collegiate swimmer back in the day. And she's also at the center of a horde of many deeply important UVA-wide initiatives. She wears many hats. So Jaideep and Sarah, welcome to Who's in STEM. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And when we speak to you, we are trying to change your mind, your brain. So your brain plasticity is in action when we talk to you. (laughs) Ken, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. So, Jaideep, you're the director of the Brain Institute. Not everyone knows what the Brain Institute is, so tell us, what is the Brain Institute here at UVA? So, Brain Institute was founded in 2016 with the the desire to uh, address challenges that you just referred to. My personal realization in founding the Brain Institute was realizing that it is team science interdisciplinary work that will lead to great progress in diseases such as autism, Alzheimer's disease, or intellectual disability. And I began as a a bench scientist focused on my 
little lab and what I did in that lab. But in, in early 2010s, I had an opportunity to organize a multi-center, 60-site NIH-funded clinical trial where 180 scientists, clinicians, uh, clinical research coordinators had to work together towards a common goal to advance treatment of status epilepticus, which is life-threatening seizures. And that changed my view. And across grounds in the UVA neuroscience community from college engineering school of medicine, also felt strongly that interdisciplinary research in neuroscience would make major advances. So that's what led to the founding of the, and, and President Sullivan shared that vision. So she founded this institute. Yeah, so that's really impressive. Just to give me a sense of scale. So you said that uh, this first interdisciplinary project had, I think you said 180 scientists so help me, in your lab, a single lab alone, how many scientists would make up one lab? Usually there's four to ten people in a lab. A big lab is uh, it gets into double digits. Yeah, so this is really many hands make light work or many brains attack difficult problems. So very impressive. So can you tell us a little bit more about the origin study? What did your research team, what did they discover about epilepsy and what were your fellow UVA colleagues in brain and neuroscience, what were they working on at the time that made you come to the decision that a major institute, a major initiative is warranted? What I had worked on was very prolonged seizures that are life-threatening. Most seizures, 99% of them will uh, come to an end by themselves, but some of them will continue and they can, it can kill or cause permanent brain damage. So how long is a long seizure? Five minutes. and Anything that lasts more than five minutes, the rescue squad has to come in. Mm -hmm. Early in my life working in a lab on rats, I had shown that earlier you treat the seizures, faster they get treated. So that led to a change in treatment. So instead of waiting to bring the patients to the hospital to treat them, we now are all across the world treat patients right there in their home near in the rescue squad, don't wait to come to the hospital to begin treatment. And then if those drugs fail, what do you do next was the question I worked on with large group of people across the country. But here at UVA, we were making major advances in focused ultrasound. Many of you have heard this is brain surgery with sound, not without using a scalpel, but uh, that work no was... Yeah, uh, or blood. And this work needed an interdisciplinary approach. We needed to build scientists around Jeff Elias, who was leading this effort, so that we could continue to apply this revolutionary technology and stay uh, ahead of the game in, uh, worldwide, because now this technology has been adopted everywhere in the world. So we wanted to do that. For a long time, we wanted to address big societal problems such as Alzheimer's disease, intellectual disability, and autism, and we wanted to bring teams together to work on that. So that's, that's how it started. Great. So let's fast forward almost to now, or let's say to last year, the grand challenge is the $75 million investment. So Sarah, this would be a question for you. So the Office of the Vice President of Research under Ram Melasubramanian devised these grand challenges, and the mission is quite simple. The idea is to advance knowledge and serve the Commonwealth of Virginia, the nation, and the world. How do we do it? Through research and scholarship. And with the enthusiastic support from President Ryan and my boss, Provost Balcom, uh, the UV8 grand challenges were launched. And, well, last summer, as I mentioned earlier, under the stewardship of Vice Provost Megan Barnett, and VPR Mel, you received a $75 million grant investment in brain and neuroscience. So what are the goals? Tell us about your grand challenge. What are the goals and how's it coming along? Yeah, Ken, it's definitely an exciting time to be a neuroscientist at UVA. The grand challenges in neuroscience are broadly speaking meant to encourage, like Jajeep said, wide interdisciplinary connections across all of our units at UVA for the benefit of society, ultimately. And the support associated with this award infuses our community with resources to not only recruit the next generation of neuroscience leaders in our labs, in our classrooms, in our clinics, but also through collaboration with the Brain Institute is helping us unite people across grounds. So I want you to think like bench to bedside. 
Um, Through the process of the grand challenges, the community chose to focus our effort on four main areas of excellence that we viewed we had here at UVA. And if we had continued investment and growth, we would be able to make groundbreaking discoveries that would kind of meet those societal challenges. And so those four areas, and Jadeep has alluded to most of them, are Alzheimer's, disease research and care, neuroimmunology and neuroimaging. So again, kind of thinking about focused ultrasound, blood-brain barrier, right, the immune system in the brain, autism and neurodiversity, and with a, a particular link to understanding how we could develop unique and personalized intervention for children diagnosed with intellectual disabilities or autism. And then four, neural development. Precision treatment. Precision right. treatment. Precision treatment. Right. right. And then the fourth is neural development, where we're deeply diving in what it really takes to build a human brain. And so from these distinct areas, you can see we have international expertise in neuroscience across the human lifespan. So we're literally thinking about the brain from molecules to minds to society. And so the Brain Institute is poised to not only support each area of excellence, but to also try to connect all of them together in these areas. So beyond... Part of that major significant investment of that $75 million is to hire about 25 new faculty, which we are incredibly excited about. Uh, We have seven or eight that we've already hired in the first year. Um, Some of these include names like Sarah Flowers, Lulu Jiang, Sai Yu Lee, Stephanie Sakara, and they're in schools of medicine, the college, engineering, data science. So these neuroscientists are landing all over grounds. Along with those hires, the Brain Institute, as Jadeep said, was kind of renewed or given additional funds for five years to continue to facilitate the growth and innovation across grounds. So we're working with clinicians and basic scientists alike. So for an example, George Bloom in biology and Carol Manning in the School of Medicine, both interested in Alzheimer's disease, helping them come together. We're taking our discoveries from the bench to these patient populations, for example, treatments in Alzheimer's. We're also recruiting, mentoring, and supporting the next generation of academic leaders. So the Brain Institute has launched what we're calling our Brain Postdoctoral Fellowship Program, where we're recruiting some of the country's brightest minds to come here to UVA to do research and launch their careers. We're also making connections, quite literally, get that joke, between scientists across grounds and submitting large center grants and training grants. And this is really reflecting the vibrant and exceptional community of scholars we have here. How has the response been? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're scoring really well. We have a lot of big grants out. There's a Virginia Alzheimer's Disease Center grant um, that we're all crossing our fingers on. So it's been really f- fantastic. So at the end of the day, we really do see UVA as an engine of discovery that can take all that we learn from the bench to the bedside to really help our patients uh, and society benefit. So I do want to emphasize uh, one point from the many that you've made is that in the design of your grand challenge, This is cutting edge work in both fundamental research together with the evident goal for clinical results. And and that's important, right? The fundamental research has to happen if we're really going to succeed in in all scientific endeavors. So turning to what fundamental research is, I'd like to talk about your work. You're a biologist. Unlike Jaideep, you don't see patients. And so I assume you've always been driven by just mysteries of the brain. And so, yeah, tell us about that. How did you originally get into neuroscience and what's your work about? Yeah, so I am a a biologist, as you said, although I would say Jadeep is also a biologist. He just studies human biology a little bit more than I do. (laughs) All right. I stand corrected. But But I'm not allowed to see patients. Correct. Don't come to me if you have a human brain problem. I think many people would agree that to be at the forefront of patient care and novel treatment, we also have to be deeply invested in fundamental or basic science. And that's really what drew me to UVA. We have an exceptional hospital and an exceptional, you know, deeply talented population of clinicians, but we also have a really creative community of basic scientists. And for me, for as long as I can remember, I've always been fascinated by the developing brain. And it all started when I heard a scientist tell me, the child's brain is not simply a smaller version of an adult brain. And from there, I had a series of questions because in my mind, children's brains look like ours, but in fact, they don't. And so from there, I just had all of these questions about how do you build a child's brain and then how does that brain become an adult brain? So just to give you a little bit of background, I'm going to nerd out here for a second. During development, there are billions of cells in your brain that have to be born, neurons and glia, and they have to migrate to the precise location 
They have to interact with each other really complexly and then ultimately differentiate into really unique cells. And so this allows for the birth of a nervous system that is robust enough for things like breathing, right? But also plastic enough for things like learning and repair. And this process continues into your early 20s, right? Yeah, actually, yeah. late twenties. Late twenties. Oh, my time. I can't go back in time. We're we're, we're sunk. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, I can. <laughs> but the good news is that there is plasticity in the brain, right? Um, but despite our knowledge about how all of that stuff happens, we don't really understand the mechanisms that drive it. And so my lab has been very interested in getting this fundamental understanding about how these cells interact and how they drive development. So in my own group. I've been able to recruit fascinated neuroscientists that want to focus on glia as their cell type of interest. So glia in Greek means glue, which is a really unfortunate name because glial cells do so much more in the brain than just hold stuff together. So we're interested in how these glial cells engineer the brain, essentially. And we use zebrafish, as you alluded to, for our model. It's not just because I love water and swimming. They are an incredible system to study the nervous system. But they're not very fast fish, though. No, okay. they, are, they are not very fast. This is true. Although when you're trying to catch them in a net <laughs> oh, okay. early in the morning, okay. they're pretty fast. Um, but the reason we use them is that their nervous system develops just like ours. So they have all the same cells and all the same genes as a human brain. It's just a much simpler system. And so we can use them as a proxy to think about human development. And the time scale of development is is greatly compared, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Zebrafish have all of the functional circuits that you need for early development in the first five days of life. So we're essentially looking at from birth to about five years old in a human within five days. And don't blink. Don't blink, exactly. Yeah. But what's great is that these fish are see-through. And so what we can do is we can literally image in real time how the brain builds itself. And this is something we can't do in humans because as women are pregnant, everything happens in utero. But these zebrafish allow us right, to see these processes. So since being here at UVA, I have been incredibly lucky to work with all these amazing students and postdocs, and we've discovered new cell types, right? We found in zebrafish, you've discovered new cell types. We've discovered new cell types in the nervous system in zebrafish wow. that exist in mammals. So we've then gone on to show that they also exist in other species, but they never would have been discovered using human tissue or rodent tissue. Well, that's fascinating. So Jaideep, so as Sarah alluded to you, the hiring seems to be going wonderfully, but as a director... Maybe you could offer your take on the update of the Grand Challenge. How's it going? So besides the hiring, what we do is bring communities together. So, for example, we bring together Alzheimer's disease researchers in uh, the corner building right on the corner. And we had this fun event where uh, we called it Pitch and Catch, where eight people stood up and pitched their best research idea and it was judged right on the spot by anybody present in that room. Everybody scored it, and the top four got uh, $20,000 each. So we uh, it's we call it pitch and catch. So basically, you, you come up with your best ideas, pitch it to your peers, and we fund it. And we, uh, uh, for basic science... Is there a gong, too? Uh, yes, <laughs> I wield the gong. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, you get five minutes. That's oh, okay. it. Okay, okay. Uh, iPhone is the gong. And uh, we we give five minutes and no no slides allowed. You talk to people and convince them you have the best idea in the world and get the money. Uh, we did a basic science grants. Uh, people submitted grants. We scored them. The top ones were invited. Again, the same process. They came in and presented their best work in front of their peers, and their peers voted which ones will get money. So it does two things. We bring out the best new ideas, but it also brings people together Build community. Build because community. The, everyone knows what someone else is doing. And uh, since there is some financial reward, small but uh, significant, we can attract people so that we've also uh, developed, as Sarah alluded to, and Sarah's really worked on uh, a postdoc program. One of the challenges of modern science is that the workforce is not sufficient to meet our challenges. We, we, we're losing our PhDs to uh, private sector at a pace faster than ever. And to keep uh, to bring the top talent, we, we have to give extra money and extra care to make sure that our postdocs go on to faculty positions and continue their tradition. It's just there is nationwide shortage of scientific workforce, and we've in, expanded the 
Sarah has expanded the program in fundamental neuroscience. We're working on the graduate program and the postdoc program. Finally, we are working on clinical grants, giving out those ones. Those are much more complex to give because there are human beings involved, and we are gradually working through giving out those monies. Those we get directly involved in, our staff would actually help implement those human research. One of the biggest challenge and, and goal for us is to engage underrepresented communities in research. Currently, if you do clinical research, what you'll recruit are upper middle class people from Charlottesville who all want to participate in research. But uh, really what research should be relevant to people in rural areas, underrepresented minorities, uh, you know, uh, Hispanic Americans, uh, uh, black Americans who have an unequal access to human research and they have to be engaged. So we, we will engage in a series of community engagement exercises so that they don't feel like we they are research subjects, but actually uh, recipients of greater care. And, and, and that's one of the uh, defining challenges for us. Uh, thank you very much for, for raising those points. You know, one of the key goals for all of the grand challenges is that the research, the findings should benefit the Commonwealth. So this is a little bit off topic, but the Environmental Institute, they're a wonderful example of outreach to the, to this, to the state, whether it's you know, work in Richmond, the work of John Goodall, or the, the work out in Appalachia where we're thinking about revitalizing uh, some of the economy with regard to uh, the potential for developing green energy industries. So these are objectives that are very important to President Ryan and Ian. And it's and, and thank you for, for raising that. I would have forgotten to, to mention that. So although I began this episode kind of in a, a funny way, talking about finding Nemo and brain farts and all of that, let's recognize that these illnesses, Alzheimer's, dementia, right, cognitive decline. All of us know someone that is probably struggling today with these very significant challenges. Uh, in my family, Erica, my wife, we're both lucky that all of our parents, all four of them are still with us, but all of them are struggling. As they advance into their golden years, my dad's in his 90s, today we're, we're, we're really struggling with finding suitable care for them. With regard to my father, he has Alzheimer's and you know, just a few weeks ago, uh, it was the, the first time where after chatting with my dad for half an hour, he turned to me and said, um, well, and who are you? And nothing can prepare you for the realization that your parents are vanishing. And I regret to say all four of our parents are in that. So the work that you're doing is certainly deeply personal for me, but I'm not alone and what I want is I want to be hopeful for the future. So Jaideep, with that in mind, you know, can you offer us reasons for hope for all of us that have neighbors or parents that are struggling? So what we call Alzheimer's disease is we broadly refer to it as cognitive decline that is more than expected for that age. And there are many diseases that can cause dementia. The one that most people refer to is called Alzheimer's disease, which is a very specific disease that affects memory and cognition. That one involves what we call beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And one of the challenges for the last 20 years has been that we could not separate different kinds of dementia. The Alzheimer's disease you had to wait for somebody to die to figure out whether they really did have Alzheimer's disease and do an autopsy. So demographically, if you were to pick 100 dementia patients at random, what proportion would you expect to be struggling with Alzheimer's? So uh, that number is controversial because where the diagnostic uh, things are coming up. So it ranges between 20 and 40 percent. And remaining people have what we call mixed or uh, vascular dementia. The good news about vascular dementia is that vascular dementia can be prevented by controlling hypertension, controlling diabetes, exercise, and a really cardiovascular risk. It's a vascular form of dementia for which we made a lot of progress over the last few decades. And understanding 
and giving knowledge to people that controlling those risk factors can reduce the rate of cognitive decline is one of the major things that we want to do. Right, so that's already very good news. And yeah. then on the Alzheimer's side, we have new diagnostic tests coming up. For example, increasingly in next few years, we'll be able to do a blood test to find these phosphorylated tau and a beta amyloid in the blood. And our own scientist, George Bloom, has shown that the one of the new tests for phosphorylated tau actually is participating in causing a loss of synapses, the brain connections that occur. And he's recently shown that these blood tests. So they are really, these blood tests are really getting to the mechanism of disease. And as that happens, as you know, the first set of beta amyloid clearing uh, therapies were just approved by FDA. The mm -hmm. first one wasn't quite as good. The second one is better. And we'll be offering that treatment at UVA in, in, in the future. So as, as we progress, there, there is great hope towards improving the outcome of these diseases. Well, this is wonderful. So just to summarize for the listeners, there's a large spectrum of types of dementia. Alzheimer's, maybe that gets most of the press, but that's the minority of cases. And for the vascular dementia cases, there are treatments, there are therapies, there are steps that patients can take to mitigate this decline. And so the prospect of a blood test is obviously super important, and that's happening here at UVA. So that's that's wonderful news. We'll have to have George Bloom on this show to, to, to learn more about that. So our time is running short, and I do want to touch on a number of other topics. Uh, so this is for you, Sarah. I, I opened this episode saying that you wear many hats at the University of Virginia, and I would be remiss if we didn't have an opportunity to talk about some of them. Tell us, what are some of the initiatives beyond the Brain Institute that you're championing here at UVA that we can feature here? Yeah. So in addition to the Brain Institute, which I'm deeply passionate about, I have these other intersecting kind of initiatives that I am honored to be a part of. Jadeep mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I'm the director for the program in fundamental neuroscience. This is a new program in the college that started a couple years ago that is built around our neuroscience major for our undergraduate students. UVA has one of the oldest undergraduate majors in the country, mm -hmm. actually starting in 2002. And it was very, very small and only 25 students could get in. And, you know, the faculty met in the college and we were becoming frustrated just as the students were, right? Why was this major so small and why weren't we really investing in growing it? Because, again, we're thinking about the future of neuroscience, right? As Jadeep said, we're discovering some things in our clinics and our labs, but it's this next generation that's really, right, going to make headway with some of these diseases in society. And so we built the program of fundamental neuroscience with the blessing of Dean Balcom. Our, you know, who is now Provost Balcom, to expand the neuroscience major. And we've gone from 25 majors, we're up to 140 now. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping in the future, this coming spring, to take the cap off so that we can continue to train the next generation of neuroscience majors. And we're super excited about that. In addition to that, I feel very tired talking about this all. I am <laughs> <laughs> also <laughs> partnering with HHMI Driving Change Initiative, which so is- tell in, everybody what HH means. Uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Mm -hmm. um, the UVA, as you may have seen in UVA Today earlier in the year, received a really major grant from HHMI to drive change in STEM at the University of Virginia. Um, and driving this change has kind of changed the culture of STEM, which can be very competitive and not collaborative but also right to help increase diversity of right the minds that are in the room trying to solve these societal problems. And so I've partnered with this HHMI Driving Change to develop this program called the Core Scholars Program, which is the Community for Opportunities and Research Excellence. And so this is a brand new undergraduate inclusive excellence STEM program. I work really closely aside our program coordinator, Donnell Wright. And what we do is we support first-gen, low-income students who are not traditionally thinking about STEM as a major to help them launch here at UVA and really become the leaders and innovators of STEM of tomorrow. And so it's been really great to be in this room with these students who are deeply passionate about collaborating, building community, and building diversity into right our STEM initiatives here at UVA so that they can kind of filter into not only neuroscience, I'm biased, I would love many mm -hmm. of them to become neuro majors, but math and SDS and engineering to really think about how we can tackle broadly problems of society with STEM in mind. So tell me, how many students are in this year's cohort? 
This year's cohort has 23 students. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, they're a fantastic bunch. Super. So a, a brief digression here. Although universities seem to often run on a glacial time scale, uh, here at UVA, we're actually pretty good at responding to and leading trends. So as you described with regard to the neuroscience major, I think many of you might now know that the undergraduate BS program in the School of Data Science was recently approved. These are recent, but this trend has a long history. And I'd like to remind people that the University of Virginia is the first major university to have a department in environmental science. So although when you walk around grounds, it looks old and you feel important because the rotunda is a beautiful building, make no mistake, the stewardship that the deans have, have provided historically is one of the reasons why UVA is always at the top of uh, these various public school rankings. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jaideep. One last question, I guess. For students who are thinking about majoring or thinking in, in neuroscience or who are thinking about becoming involved in the Brain Institute or the Grand Challenge, or maybe high school students who are thinking about where they will be applying to college, what parting thoughts could you share for them? Jaideep. I always say the same thing to all my students. There is so much opportunity to explore and live the life of mind. Literally, it's the life of mind. Sarah. Reach out. Go to thebraininstitute.virginia.edu. Go to neuroscience.virginia.edu or reach out to Jadeep and I. I mean, our part of our roles as directors of the Brain Institute is to make connections, literally. So we're here to help point people in the right direction and introduce them to who they need to meet. Sarah, Jaideep, super. You're both fulfilling President Ryan's vision for UVA to be great and good in all that we do. Thank you for your dedication and for using your skills as researchers and leaders of the Brain Institute and all of the related initiatives. So Godspeed to you and your collaborators in your work. And I'm Ken Ono, STEM advisor to the provost and the Marvin Rosenblum professor of mathematics. And you've been listening to Who's in STEM. Who's in STEM is a production of WTJU 91.1 FM and the Office of the Provost at the University of Virginia. Who's in STEM is produced by Katherine Kossaboom, Claire Curzan, Rhea Verma, Mary Garner McGee, and Ariane Ballou. Our music is composed and performed by Robert Schneider and John Ferguson of Apples and Stereo. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Listen and subscribe to Who's in STEM on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back soon with another conversation about scientific and technological innovation at the University of Virginia. Mm-hmm.